time yeah. to call it. I, I have to be very strict. <laughs> it's uh, it's 3.30, so... Let's make a start, yes. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm uh, Robert Sproson. I'm here on behalf of RiskWest Open. They even gave me a T-shirt. Literally, I have the T-shirt. Uh, and I'm aware that uh, I've only got a 30 minute uh, slot before we get locked into the building, so I'll try and talk, um, try and get through my slides. I think it's uh, 17 slides, so it's about one every two minutes, so we should be okay. So here we are at the Big Ben Experience 2022. That's got rid of one slide already, so we're, we're a good way through the pile. Why are we here? And that's quite a deep and uh, meaningful question. You obviously all have your reasons to come here. You've probably traveled uh, from, from various parts of the Netherlands and probably spent quite a lot of money on the train to get here. Um, you, you all have your reasons to meet up with other people, to talk about Risk OS, um, all have your motivations. So Risk OS Open also has its motivations. It has a purpose. And that's what the first few slides are, are talking about. What motivates RiskOS Open? Why, why are we here? What are we doing all this work for uh, to keep RiskOS going? And I think probably if there was one word on the slide to look at, the word there is open. That's the bit that, uh, that's the bit that motivates RiskOS Open the most. Everything that RiskOS Open does, it tries to be open about. So. There are sections of its website where you can have a discussion on the forum with other people. Now, obviously sometimes those discussions get more heated than others. Um, and in general, you probably won't see anyone from RiskOS Open wading in and, and counter arguing or, or having, having a fist fight with someone because that's not, it's not advancing RiskOS at all. It's just, it's just w heated words uh, and take, taking, a, um, taking a very political view to this. RiskOS Open tries to be as, very, as neutral as it possibly can. It's, it's an open organisation. It doesn't have money motivated shareholders. No one's taking a salary. Um, it's all about uh, keeping, keeping RiskOS uh, advancing forwards. Um, and then there are a set of bounty schemes that, um, that RiskOS Open runs. And again, it, that's trying to be in as open a way as possible. There's an upfront proposal of here's the work that's being planned. As a community, which of these do you like the look of? And, and there's kind of a voting system by virtue of if someone puts 10 pounds or, or 10 euros uh, into one of the bounties, it, it goes up. And naturally, you will see a balance that the bounties that have no interest to anyone, they'll kind of wither and die. You know, it's, it's brutal, but um, there was one to change the, um, the background colors of the filer windows a few years ago. That was open for a year and it had attracted 12 pounds. So it was clearly you know, in an open, open voting system, nobody was interested in that bounty, either in contributing to it or doing the work. So that one got culled. Um, there are other much, much bigger bounties, which obviously are part of, the, um, part of keeping the OS uh, relevant with current hardware, like the Raspberry Pi 4, for example. Um, uh, which have stayed open and, and have attracted a lot of interest. So, and if you want to find out the status of those bounties, it's all on the website. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing secret about any of those bounties. So Steve, uh, Steve Revel, the, the uh, managing director of Risk S Open, tried to condense all of those thoughts down into one sentence. And that's what we came up with. So safeguarding the past, present, and future of Risk S for everyone. And the, the words, the key, the key words there are in, in bold. So past, present, future, and everyone. So yes, the Ionix computer might be quite old now. It's, 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 in fact, it's 19 years old, I think. It's quite old. But that's not a reason to not support it. Just because there's, there may only be a few hundred people still using it around the world. We're trying to safeguard the past, present, if you've got to keep saying this, aren't I? Safeguarding the past, present, and future of risk risk for everyone, that includes potentially minority groups. It includes, um, you know, Raspberry Pi is by far the most downloaded version of risk OS. Um, it's something like, if you plot it, that there is a, again, there's a graph on the um, rule website from during uh, lockdown in, uh, it's about April 2020, 
there's a graph of number of downloads per day sorted by system and there are so many people downloading the Raspberry Pi version we had to pr plot it on a logarithmic scale you, if you plotted it on a linear scale you couldn't see the other downloads so you know, again that's catering for everyone but there's no reason to not support um, not support the older platforms as well and to try and keep an eye on the future the future will become important in the second half of my talk So just a quick whiz through, uh, I'm aware of time, a quick whiz through some of the uh, past achievements. So for years and years, so uh, risk -Us Open was formed in 2006, um, and at the time, the best that uh, we could manage to negotiate with Castle was to use their shared source license, which was a slightly odd two-way street where everyone does all the work, Castle gets all the results. It didn't seem quite a... It's an odd way to arrange a license, but it was the best that could be negotiated. So given a choice between RiskOS dies when Castle uh, closed their company or RiskOS keeps going, but with a slightly odd license, well, OK, l the lesser of the two there is to go with the, um, the slightly odd license. But eventually, after lots of, uh, after lots of asking and lots of pummeling, Eventually, uh, it was agreed to change to the Apache license, which is a totally it's a recognized, the, the reason it's capitalized is uh, open source has a specific uh, meaning for its FOSS, the free open source software license, um, which is um, one that's called an Apache license. That's a technicality that doesn't really matter. But the key thing was it's open source and there was no longer a, uh, a commercial incentive for um, or no longer a need for a commercial organization to pay to use it. And if you compare that with how Linux works, no one's paying Linux licenses to anyone. So it was a, a little bit odd to have an open source, as in the source code was available, uh, version of RiskOS, but that you still had to pay for. It was very odd. So you obviously know about the RiskOS open forum. Everyone is uh, welcome to join that. and. Uh, chat with other users um, I don't know just a quick show of hands how many people have used the risk -S open forum I know at least read, oh more than half excellent okay so yeah usually you'll get you'll get an answer from someone uh, and uh, usually it will be a helpful answer not always sometimes the topics wander off to a totally different area uh, and I talked a little bit about the bounty scheme earlier so so far, um, Rule has delivered uh, nine bounties, so proposed, collected the funds for, a developer has worked on, and then that has been integrated with the OS. Uh, and then there are five more uh, that are currently in progress. Um, if we get time, I've got a fancy graphic to show with all of those um, plotted on a timeline later, but uh, I'll skip over that for now. So the five that are currently open, I think, are it's a Git source control client, which is for use by developers to check out uh, Git source code. Uh, TCPIP, uh, uh, Paint. Paint has been a, a slow, a slow burner. That one. That's uh, each new version of Paint is better and less crashy than the previous version, but it's still not quite reached perfection. Uh, and then reworking the uh, toolbox modules for them to. Um, be on a par with what uh, RiskOS Limited worked on uh, as part of the select scheme, and then a fifth one. No, no, I've mentioned that one. Oh, there's, oh, uh, that's the one. Thank you. Filing, filing system. Yes, adding partition support. So, I've had several questions today about how the Raspberry Pi uh, disk image uh, works, and it's it's complicated that you have a a special version of. Uh, uh, file core format and then you overlay the DOS part on top of it so that the uh, Raspberry Pi bootloader can find it. It's a bit of a weird uh, unintuitive arrangement and really what, what all other operating systems do is set the disk into separate partitions and each operating system only lives in its own partition. Uh, so yes, thank you, that was the fifth one. I knew there were five. Uh, and so uh, RiskOS Open also manages the source code to the main OS ROMs, and there have been six stable releases uh, over the last 15 years. Uh, we should be inching towards a new stable release. I think if my calendar is right, it should be sometime before Christmas this year, so 5.30. Uh, 
uh, is underway and that will obviously fold in all of the work and fixes that you've seen uh, since 5.28 came out. Um, the other thing to mention about the stable release um, uh, term there is that's not to say that the nightly um, beta versions are unstable. It just means that they haven't been tested by anybody. So then every night a new version of RiskOS is available to download from the RiskOS Open website. But that was generated by a computer while I was fast asleep. No, no one ever looked at that. So you're essentially you're downloading you know, a, an untested beta. Generally they work fine. Uh, occasionally you'll get a bug introduced that will do something weird, but they're, 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 generally, they're generally pretty good. Um, the stable releases um, get tested by actual humans, so if somebody uh, goes through those and has a checklist, uh, and if you want, to, going back to the open from earlier, the checklist is available on the rule website. It's a, a very simple um, check of which um, new programmer APIs and things you have introduced, so it's, it's um, all, all open to uh, for you to see what goes into a stable release. So hopefully that will be um, updated. I'm going to guess sometime in early June, to, so you'll be able to see what's coming in 5.30. And the uh, so walking through the past here, um, the NutPy um, distribution was put together, and essentially that's about £600 worth of uh, commercial software from everyone uh, active in, in RiskOS application development, which builds on top of the OS. So the RiskOS Pi that you download is just the base operating system with its built-in uh, applications and then NutPy adds about uh, another 15 um, commercial applications on top of that and generally if you need two or three of those it's cheaper to do it that way than to get RiskOS Pi and then go and buy the individual applications it's a pretty good break-even point and the important thing about that is not so much that RiskOS Open is selling the cut RiskOS Open doesn't make any money from selling the Epic because the money goes back divided in proportion to each of the developers. So since that was <coughs> produced, um, at, at last count, and the, these numbers will be a few months out of date, about £21,000, so €25,000, something like that, has been given back to the application developers. So the, the, the RiskOS, uh, RiskOS running on a Raspberry Pi, when I was talking about the, the sheer volume of downloads that that corresponds to, you know, that multiplier, let's say, a thousand people a week download it. If only one of those people buys an Epic or a NutPy, that's 52, and they're 50 pounds each, so that's 2,500 pounds. So it quickly adds up to um, to um, fueling new development from all of the uh, existing developers. So if you've walked past the stand today, you'll have also noticed uh, some updating of the um, various books and guides that Acorn used to make. So I'm trying to go through them in date order. There's the style guide uh, we did, followed by the uh, desktop development book. So that was a, a box set of three with the compiler and the assembler and, and debuggers and so on. Uh, then there's the BBC Basic reference manual, which is a hefty sort of 600 page uh, tome and then the uh, user guide uh, most recently. So these are all um, books that are sitting now in the, um, I don't know, if you, I'm sure you have the equivalent of a copyright library, so if, uh, if a thunderbolt strikes rural headquarters and it burns to the ground, don't worry, there are copies lodged in the copyright library uh, in the UK for future generations, uh, if, uh, or if a meteorite strikes. Um, Sites set on more is a reference to um, the books that we haven't yet got round to editing are the toolbox manual and that comes as a side effect of the toolbox bounty so the toolbox bounty is updating the code and then at the end of that you'll end up with an updated manual because Acorn really didn't uh, get the mix right when it only provided the toolbox manual with the desktop development environment they, they don't really go together you're supposed to be able to use the toolbox from basic and other languages the fact that they only ever let you have the toolbox manual if you had got a DDE seems a bit odd. So we're hoping to, to break that tie and make the toolbox manual something that's independent so that people who don't like to write stuff in, in C and compile it uh, can have, have the uh, latest manual for that. And obviously the big one, the Whopper, is the 5,000 odd pages in the programmer's reference manual, which um, if, 
you've ever seen or try to lift the printed copy of that it's a hefty tome so uh, there's there's a lot of work as in probably more than a man year of work uh, in updating that and specifically there it's not worrying about what the format of the manual is it's literally the text is not present if you want to learn about how to program the USB drivers and you open the programmer's reference manual that chapter just isn't there it's not that it's not that it's in the wrong font or somebody's got some spelling mistakes or something like that it's just nope there's no chapter on USB there's no chapter on PCI oh well you know these are all buses that we actively use every day but we're, we're hampered by 25 year old uh, manuals desktop development environment I was just talking about decoupling that from the uh, toolbox so that used to be I think it was 249 pounds originally I think Castle might have made it 200 pounds or something like that that's now been cut down to 50 pounds which is pretty much um, I think the lowest it can possibly go there are some odd license terms to do with um, some of the IP is licensed from ARM which means that you can't give it away and it has to run on an ARM processor and other weird things like that. So um, the important thing from a developer's point of view is probably more that it's vastly improved. So at the time, it could compile C99 uh, code, and the assembler knew everything up to, I think, the X scale, so ARM architecture 5. Uh, it's now been brought forward to the latest C standard, which is C18, and to support ARM V8, which is the latest ARM processor as well. Um, and then I'm going to sneak in, although it's in the section on the past, I'm going to sneak in a, a pre-mention of an update that's going to be coming out in the next week or two, which is to change the ABC compiler, which is the one that compiles BASIC into machine code, um, now supports the vector floating point, so any of your floating point calculations will suddenly get a lot faster uh, in a week or two's time. And then, yeah, I put in a, a mention of the Raspberry Pi 4 again just because it's one of the most downloaded versions of RISC-OS so uh, RISC-OS Open sponsored the driver work to get the USB working and the video and it's another interface that I've now forgotten maybe it's oh, Ethernet yes that was it so although on the front on the face of it the Raspberry Pi looks very similar to all of the other Raspberry Pis uh, the transition from Pi 3 to Pi 4 was actually quite a big jump it was a totally different processor, a totally different set of peripherals, and a totally different Ethernet chip. So it required quite a lot of work to get that one going. And then, yeah, when I was talking earlier about past, present, and future uh, for everyone, um, there's no reason to uh, turn your nose up an A7000. A7000 is still a perfectly respectable computer. Um, A7000 Plus is slightly better, but A7000 uh, right up until the current Raspberry Pi 400, all of those, they can run RISC-OS 5, and so they do. There's no reason to, uh, to drop support for something if it still works. Right, on to the present. I promise there's less stuff on this one, this one slide. Um, so yeah, I already mentioned that uh, hopefully sometime between now and Christmas, there'll be a new version of RISC-OS 5 coming out, so 5.30. Uh, and you'll learn uh, sometime in uh, late May or early June what's in and what's not. So there'll be a list of some features will get dropped because um, there isn't time to fix or finish them in time. Some features will be in, so bits of, for example, the toolbox work that's completed, that will be in. Then, yeah, if you're brave and want to take one of the uh, odd-numbered versions, then uh, those are available every night uh, from the rule download page. Uh, and as of fairly recently, uh, as in last two years or so, if you go to packages.riskosopen.org, there are zip files for each of the individual applications that are on the disk. So if you think, oh, I need a new version of the printer manager, you don't now have to download the whole thing again. You can just go and get that one zip file. Uh, and the most recent um, RISC-OS Pi micro SD cards also have everything handled by the package manager. So if you want to want to say if you want to get everything up to date and save yourself the effort, you can now just run Pacman and it will go and query packages.riskosopen.org by some magic, uh, and then it will download the updates for you. Is it also for the ROM? Uh, no, so we haven't done the ROM yet, and that's only through a caution that if you change the ROM and something goes wrong 
you're, you're dead. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the, the things that are packaged at the moment are all the disk-based applications. They're nice and safe, yeah. Uh, so yes, you'll, you'll hear me and see me and other people from RiskOS Open talking about the, the bounties. So there are some that are collecting at the moment that you can see on the rule website. There's a little breakdown of what's in each one. And had I remembered that list earlier, I would have remembered uh, yeah, the filing system one. So those are the five that are currently running. And there's behind the scenes, I, I should add that running a bounty isn't just a programming exercise. That's a lot of it. A lot of it is just typing code. Um, there's, a, there's a, the advising and the management of it, making sure that the developer has the tools that they need. If they ask a question, how does the window manager work? Someone has to go and go and find the answer to how does that part of the window manager work in order to fix something in the toolbox. So there's, yeah, there's the, the pure activities that relate to the bounties themselves and then outside of that uh, bubble there are, there's an ongoing dialogue. Um, and if you want to see the status of those, um, if you go to the bounties page on rules website, there's a more info button at the bottom and that will show you literally the last email exchange uh, that was on that topic. So if you can keep right up to date. Uh, people who are excited by source code, and maybe that's not everyone, uh, if you go to gitlab.riskresopen.org, uh, you can see all the latest source code, download it, compile it for yourself if you want. Um, there's also a, a slowly ongoing move to make things use uh, what's known as continuous integration. So when someone checks in a change, uh, the, the server that that runs on will compile it for you behind the scenes uh, and give you the answer straight away. So rather than having to wait or, or build it yourself, um, it can be all done automatically. And then I think the monitor has squashed the, uh, the second line of this a bit much, uh, but part of the RISC-OS 5.30 work are some enhancements to the desktop experience. So if you've seen the um, Raspberry Pi that's sitting on the stand that I've been at today, you'll have seen this backdrop with the colored swirls uh, on as the desktop wallpaper. Uh, and there's now a feature in RISC-OS 5.29, the current beta version, where you can change the background of the icon bar. So I've changed that to be a translucent version of that graphic. So you, if you look at the desktop, it looks like your your icon bar at the bottom is is partly see-through so it's a, it's a low cost des desktop enhancement but it's a desktop enhancement nonetheless you know, if, if i look at my desktop, i have exactly that i have if i if i hide a window behind the um the icon bar i can see through that because it's it appears to be translucent so you can you can cheat and get a very similar effect now uh, on risk OS 5 uh, and another example of that is um, I know a lot of people don't like the clutter of having their scrap directory and their, um, their choices directory hidden away inside the boot application, which makes them um, backing up quite complicated because you end up with a mix match of things that are readable and things that are writable and things that are scary operating system things that you definitely shouldn't touch and things that are nice choices that you should touch. So they're all a bit stirred together at the moment. So. Uh, another example of that is uh, the ability to move those outside of the boot application um, uh, and have them uh, wherever you want. So that's coming very soon. Yeah, I thought that bottom line uh, didn't, didn't work on that screen. So onto the future, and this is the bit where uh, you might need some uh, headache tablets because it's going to get more technical if you thought my talk was not technical enough already. So there's a list of, let's whiz through the list. There's a, si a list of six big headline topics here. And this is what, this is what keeps RiskOS open awake at night. This is the things, you know, fixing little one-line bugs. They, ne it needs, they need fixing and it becomes part of the next stable release. But we're trying to think, where is RiskOS in five years time? There's no good in just making little one-line changes once a week because you'll, you'll still be standing in exactly the same place in five years' time. So what are the big, six big topics that keep RiskOS open awake at night? Multi-monitor support. So we've started to get hardware where you can have potentially two video heads, two desktops um, that showing at the same time. So the Raspberry Pi supports that, uh, the Titanium computer supports that, and I think some of the um, Panda boards, the Panda board ES, I think has two sockets as well. 
but at the moment RiskOS only knows about how to plot one video head. So you always end up in a situation with one black monitor and one with your desktop on. It'd be really nice to be able to spread across those so you could have your email open on one and a web browser open on the other one, for example. Um, but that, there's quite a bit of machinery behind the scenes to get that right. It's really easy to show one image on two desktops. That's very easy to do. What's more tricky is the user experience. If you get an error box that opens, RiskOS at the moment centers that on the screen. But if you have two desktops, then the error box will be split across two monitors. That doesn't make any sense. So there needs to be some machinery behind the scenes there that knows that you have two monitors and that if an error box comes up, you put it on the one that you're currently looking at, which is probably the one with the mouse pointer on it, for example. So some work, work going on there to design that. Um, I get there's, there are actually uh, wiki pages for all six of these. Um, I didn't paste the addresses in because they'll be far too small to read, but um, if you come to see me on the stand later, I can tell you where they are. They're, they're just on the rule wiki. Um, enhancements to BBC Basic. Many people, many, many people request structure support in Basic so that you can do um, you know, structure dot, you know, um, I don't know, train ticket dot passenger, train ticket uh, dot um, route number, train ticket dot departure time, that sort of thing. So at the moment, BBC Basic doesn't handle that, and uh, anyone who's dared to look inside BBC Basic, it's quite a scary module internally. Um, so we're trying to work out two aspects of that. The first one is how to get the syntax right, and a lot of that ground has been covered by. Um, um, I've just forgotten his name, Richard Russell, uh, who has written a Windows version of BBC Basic and helped to spec the original BBC Micro version. So he's already worked out a lot of the syntax to do with structures. So actually there's a reasonable amount that we can just copy. <laughs> no point in inventing a new syntax, he's already thought about it. Um, but we've also had a call with um, Sophie Wilson, the person that wrote Basic in the first place, um, to try and ask what were the things that you forgot to put in basic? What were the things that you never had the money to do when you were at Acorn? So we've got a nice little list of things um, that Sophie had always wanted to add. Um, but this all comes back to how would you implement it? And I'm going to talk a bit about number six in a moment. Um, and there's probably an element of uh, enhancing basic that says you shouldn't be writing it in ARM assembler anymore. It's prob... Around three, four minutes left. Okay, yeah. right, okay, i really start talking quickly. Uh, LPAE, Large Physical Address Extensions, uh, are allowing you to access memory more than two gigabytes. So that's a, that's a technical thing rather than an exciting thing to look at. Uh, Multi-core processing uh, is in a similar vein to the multi-monitor support. Quite a lot of ARMs now, you find that you get four cores or two cores on the chip, and at the moment, RiskOS only knows how to use one of those. So that's another big topic. Vector floating point is where ARM have finally uh, decided to design a hardware floating point unit which is really, really fast, but RISC-REST doesn't use it, or not very much. So we're still busily emulating the FPA, the floating point accelerator that was the original design, um, but because we're emulating it, it's also quite slow. So there's a lot of cheap speed improvements there, and I was talking about ABC, the <coughs> compiler earlier, is an example of that where you can get typically you know, between five and 10 times faster floating point just by turning on the hardware that, that's already in, in the box. And this last one, addressing the end of ARM as we know it. I do not know if I can get through all this in two minutes. We'll have a good go. Right, in the 26-bit era, we had Sophie and Steve Ferber's original design, which was very, very simple design because essentially they had no money so they were designing it uh, on, on uh, low-end computers on their own uh, somewhere in a bunker at uh, Acorn. And because they had no money, they ended up doing a design that was probably laid out by hand with very few transistors. Now, if you've got a mobile phone in your pocket, you'll have probably stumbled upon the fact that that meant, because there are very few transistors, there's very little leakage. Very little leakage means it's very low power. Very low power means ARM owns all of your mobile phones. But they squeezed the program counter into a 32-bit number, packed the flags and the 2-bit mode into that same 32-bit number. And if you work that out, 32 minus 4 
minus 2 equals 26. So that's where the limit of 64 megabytes of code came from because they were trying to pack all of that stuff into just one register. So the 26-bit era had the advantage that because they had no money, the instruction set was very orthogonal. It was very repetitive. You could tell each instruction could be conditional. Each conditional instruction could use any register. So it was all very symmetrical. If you drew it out on paper, it all made sense. They reserved a bit of space in the instruction set for coprocessors, so the FPA and the VFP uh, floating point stuff is all done as, through coprocessors. But Acorn were running out of money, so they were being pulled away from their desktop towards video on demand, so set-top boxes, and stuff, mobile-related stuff. And I found this old photo of an Apple Newton, so Apple stumped up a load of money. Uh, that's got an ARM 6 inside it, 26-bit ARM 6. Um, but uh, that all combined together to give you the ARM 7 TDMI. If I remember the letters, T is for thumb, so that was where they shrunk the instruction set to 16 bits so that it could run on embedded devices. D is for debug, M is a multiplier, and I is ice pick, which is something debugging, don't worry about it too much. So the ARM 7 TDMI is a very popular processor, but my suspicion is by this time, Acorn were probably asleep at the wheel because they've missed the chance now by ARM 7 TDMI of switching to 32-bit mode. This, this was a time when the processors had all of the 26-bit problems that we just looked at um, sorted out, which I've got another graphic off. There we go. So what they did there is they split the program counter to have uh, all of the address bits up to the top one. Bottom two bits get used to signal whether you're running in thumb mode or not. And then the flags get transferred into a separate register. So essentially, that's how you escape the 64-bit, uh, sorry, the um, 64 megabyte um, memory limit that the 26-bit stuff has. So yeah, ARM 600 onwards has it, but Acorn didn't use it. And it wasn't until the Ionix came out in the early 2000s where suddenly you were faced with a problem that, well, this processor no longer has 26-bit mode at all. So what are we going to do? So quick run through the ARM architectures. ARM v4 is where the strong ARM came out. So that one, you were lucky that they still had 26-bit mode hidden in there but it got complicated because they split the caches into two. ARM v5 is the first one where you uh, had to run in 32-bit mode. So in other words, you got, you got one more architecture version and then they killed it. So now we're into the 32-bit only section. So ARM v6 and v7 is what the Raspberry Pis and the Titaniums and the ARM x6s, they all use that. And that really is kind of a sweet spot for RISC-OS because there's suddenly an explosion of the number of boards that you can run RISC-OS on, um, provided you can run stuff in 32-bit mode. But it's also the last family. So I talked about this being one, one version behind and then they killed it. It's also the last family where you're guaranteed 32-bit mode. There is ARM v8 which we know some of the Raspberry Pi, so the Pi 4 is an ARM V8 processor, and they did fortunately leave 32-bit mode enabled in that, so we're okay. But there are a class of ARM V8s where that's gone. Um, and when you get to V9, um, there's a little tiny footnote, if you're trying to uh, license ARMs uh, now, there's a little footnote that says, oh, you might be able to have 32-bit mode, it'll cost you a lot of money, and we're not sure if you'll, give it, you'll get it. So essentially, V5 was where they killed 26-bit mode, and V9, 32-bit mode is gone. That's a, a fair summary. In fact, so much so I went to ARM's website and filtered what application processors can I get. Click, and you get 20 answers. And you think, oh, well, 20, that's loads, surely. But then if I cross out the ones that don't have 32-bit mode anymore, I've actually only left with... Five, six, seven, eight, nine. I've got less than half of them. There's only nine out of the 20 ARM cores that you can currently get actually have 32-bit mode still. So we're into a scary world where in a few years' time you simply won't be able to get 32-bit chips anymore. So we need to start thinking about 64-bit memory addresses. So essentially what they've done, and some of this is good, some of this is bad, Essentially what they've done is they've enlarged the memory space to 64 bits, so you can access many terabytes of, of uh, RAM, potentially. Uh, you can no longer access the program counter, so uh, 
previously when I said the instruction set was orthogonal and you could use any register in any instruction, uh, you can no longer get your hands on the program counter. That's partly a security thing as well, so that viruses can't, can't get them. Um, they've almost entirely dropped conditional execution. There's a few instructions like the branches that you can, but um, mostly the conditional execution is gone. Uh, load, store, multiple. Now I'm not sure I'm that excited about that, but that's gone. Um, but on the trade, on the flip side, you get now get 64-bit registers. So whenever you're doing a big calculation that involves a 64-bit number, previously you had to do it with a pair of 32-bit registers and then do lots of instructions to carry the uh, values between them. Uh, now you've got a, an unadulterated 64-bit register, so you can do it all in one. Uh, the number of modes has gone down from 16 to just 4. So that's got a bit simpler in some respects, but it's a little bit uh, alien in that uh, you don't have just user mode and supervisor mode anymore. You've got, you've got levels within that. Uh, and from a RiskWest point of view, if you've ever made an allocation request to RiskWest Open to get a SWI base, uh, you'll, you'll have noticed that actually the SWI numbers are quite large these days because lots of people have been allocating SWIs. Uh, the SWI instruction in 64-bit uh, land has been reduced to 16 bits, so as a, could cause a few trouble, a bit of trouble there. But um, because they've dropped the conditional execution, you save a few bits, and it actually means that you end up that all of your instructions are still 32 bits wide. So if you've got all of this right in your head, the instructions are 32 bit, the processor is 64 bit. It's good fun. <laughs> I promise you this will get uh, complicated. So what does a 64-bit RISC-OS look like? Well, probably quite the same. You know, the desktop, there's no reason why the desktop can't look the same. We'd still use sprite files. We'd still use draw files. All of our file names would still be of the form $.directory.name. Why not? The right clicking on things in the mouse that's not a 64-bit issue, so that wouldn't need to change. Dragging windows around, not a 64-bit issue, don't worry about it. But there are lots of 32-bit addresses hidden away in the source code. So you need to make sure that your uh, software is up to date. And I think that will cause an ongoing problem where uh, we've got SWIs and service calls where an element of an address is baked in. So there's quite a few of those, or surprisingly few. So think about everything that you've ever written in BBT Basic when you use the exclamation mark operator, pling, that's accessing a 32-bit variable. So how do you access something when it's 64-bit? Because Basic doesn't have 64-bit variables. So there's a problem hiding there. Window Manager, if you ever looked at how an icon block 